Okay, we're now getting on to video number three. Uh, video one, if you recall, was just a short one showing comparing two cars and saying basically that um, there is a difference between a greenhouse effect, which involves containment basically in glass, and an open car, which is you know representative of the open atmosphere. Uh, where convection takes place and expansion takes place. So then we looked a little more extensively into the evidence and there's an enormous amount of evidence that there's no greenhouse effect on Earth or Venus for that matter uh, caused by so-called greenhouse gases. There is a thermal enhancement and we'll come to that. I'm not saying there's no thermal enhancement and no thermal gradient, which is obvious, it exists because we can measure it. So we know that there is a thermal gradient and a thermal enhancement in the, atmosphere, in the atmospheres of all um, planets or moons that have uh, a surface pressure of over 10 kilopascals. So uh, now we're going to look at Venus. Now I'm saying here that there's no greenhouse effect caused by greenhouse gases on Venus either. So there's no greenhouse effect on Venus either. Now the special case of Venus, okay. The prevailing science for decades has been that the surface of Venus is very hot due to the greenhouse effect. This was claimed by Hansen in 1988 and John Horton in 1992. I'll reference these papers and several others, Pollock in 1980. Um, now, Venus has an atmospheric concentration of CO2 that's 2,400 times Earth's concentration. Now, this is what the current NASA website states. And I'm quoting here, Its thick atmosphere traps heat in a runaway greenhouse effect, making it the hottest planet in our solar system, with the surface temperatures hot enough to melt lead. V Venus's atmosphere consists mainly of carbon dioxide, with clouds of sulfuric acid droplets. The thick atmosphere traps the sun's heat, resulting in surface temperatures higher than 880 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 470 degrees Celsius. You can read this on the NASA website about Venus today. So they didn't give up on this idea. Now, should Venus be regarded, as some say, for example, Hunt in 1992, as a warning? If the Venusian atmosphere is full of CO2, which traps the sun's heat and causes a runaway greenhouse effect, like NASA says on its website, which leads to a horrific 470 degrees centigrade surface temperatures, are we taking a risk as well by releasing what some say are massive and dangerous amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases? A closer look at Venus is needed. That's what we're going to do here. For example, its atmospheric properties and its candidate potential for a greenhouse effect, runaway or otherwise. In effect, the question which needs to be asked is, what can be learned from Venus? So, probably the place to start is um, a table of the properties of Venus. Now, we've got all the important properties here, the surface pressure, uh, 9,200 kilopascals, which is more than 90 times the Earth's surface pressure. The atmospheric composition, very different to Earth's. Uh, Venus has 96.5% of what we call greenhouse gas, CO CO2, carbon dioxide, 3.5% nitrogen. The wind strength on the surface is very low, hardly any movement, as you can expect from that thick atmosphere. Um... Wind strength at the cloud tops, quite a different thing. Some of the strongest winds in the solar system, 360 kilometers per hour. What is driving that strong wind strength? So the, the wind actually whips around at the cloud tops many, many dozens of times faster than the planet itself rotates. Top of atmosphere insulation compared to Earth's 1360. Uh, Venus has 2644 watts per square meter. So that's how much solar energy is coming in. 1.9 times what Earth gets. 
the albedo is very high, 0.75, so Venus is covered in white fluffy clouds at the top. And um, lapse rate, very similar to Earth. Lapse rate, well, may, may as well call that order compression what it is. And density, Earth's uh, atmospheric density at the surface is 1.2 kilograms per cubic metre. Venus is 65 kilograms per cubic metre. And the mean molar mass of the atmosphere, 43.45. As you know, carbon dioxide is 44, so uh, that's the very high concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere representing itself there. But the very first thing to note, really, is the very high surface temperature at the top of the chart there. 467 degrees centigrade. Some people say 470. But anyway, where did it come from? How is it maintained? Where does Venus get the energy from to keep such a heavy, thick atmosphere so hot? Now, looking at the atmospheric conditions and the surface pressure, one thing really stands out. The near surface conditions means that the CO2 N2 atmosphere at lower levels can no longer be a gas, but must be a supercritical fluid. The reason is the critical pressure of carbon dioxide is 7,380 kilopascals and the pressure is more than that at the surface, 9,200 kilopascals. And the critical temperature of CO2 is plus 30 centigrade. Obviously the temperature uh, in the atmosphere of Venus is much higher. So the entire atmospheric surface layer of Venus to a depth of I estimate at least 4 kilometers must be a supercritical fluid, not a gas. So one question we'll come back to is, how can you have a greenhouse effect from greenhouse gases when there's no gas? That's another little interesting question. Now, Venus is a planet which is hard to explain using the greenhouse effect of CO2. There's always been difficult in explaining or in formulating a simple method to satisfactorily explain or calculate the very high surface atmospheric temperature of the planet Venus using conventional mathematical means or by employing the greenhouse gas hypothesis. Now, whatever hypothesis is used to explain the Earth's temperature, it must also take into account the universality of the physical laws of nature and of thermodynamics. So it must explain Venus as well. For instance, it must explain how a universal atmospheric thermal gradient and enhancement that is widely attributed to the action of a wholly above surface greenhouse effect, as CO2 is, as a greenhouse gases are, can still continue on with its gradient unchanged to below the surface level as it does in a mine shaft. So you still get the thermal gradient and the thermal enhancement if you dig a hole in the ground. Remember that the greenhouse effect says that it's a reflection from the surface. The IR from the surface which causes the greenhouse effect. Okay, That's one point. How can this same thermal gradient enhancement appear in atmospheres with virtually no greenhouse gases present? And how come it's the same gradient enhancement in atmospheres with high greenhouse gas concentrations like Venus, which is 96.5% greenhouse gases? So that has to be explained. And also, any hypothesis has to also explain how the temperature in the Venusian atmosphere, at the same pressure as the Earth's surface, uh, relates exactly to the Earth's average surface temperature once the different levels of solar insulation are taken into account. Despite the large differences in atmospheric greenhouse ga gas content, Venus has 96.5% greenhouse gases, Earth 2.5%. How come they're the same temperature at the same pressure once you allow for insulation? Now what we have here is the thermal gradient in the Venusian atmosphere, as recorded by these landers, the Vega 2 and the Vera. Uh, as you can see, there's very little difference between them. The Vega 2 is the solid line and the Vera is the dotted line. So this is going 60 kilometers in height, measuring the thermal gradient, the temperature in the atmosphere down to the surface. The surface on the right there, which is 740 Kelvin. 
So on the left you start at 60 kilometers in height, about 250 Kelvin. Now notice that in the bottom four kilometers you've got kilometers in height on the left. And notice that the bottom four kilometers, which I said, as I said, is a supercritical fluid, the thermal gradient just continues at the same angle. There's no change in the thermal gradient. This is quite important. Uh, if if uh, if this thermal gradient and enhancement is caused by the greenhouse effect, wouldn't you see a change in the bottom four kilometers when the gas is left behind and uh, the uh, thermal gradient moves into the supercritical fluid stage? There's no change in gradient. Also, now look at the 49 kilometer level. That's where a temperature of 340 Kelvin was measured by these satellites and others, other landers as well. Now remember the 340 Kelvin. This is an important point. Okay, now don't switch off. I promise this is the only formula you're going to see in this video. Now TV is the surface temperature of Venus. Now T is the surface temperature of Earth. Now what's that thing in the middle? Now, Venus receives 1.91 times more solar energy than the Earth does, on average. There is a relationship between the surface temperature of Venus and the surface temperature on Earth through this 1.91. Now, that little 4 there, the root of 1.91 is 1.176. I've worked it out here. Now, here's a comparison between the Earth's surface temperature at one atmosphere, remember, which is the surface. So it's 288 Kelvin, 15 degrees centigrade, if you like. And on Venus, it's 340 Kelvin at one atmosphere. We've just got the data from the Venera satellites, the Venera landers of Venus. So we know that at one atmosphere, it's 340 Kelvin on Venus. Now the relative solar insulation, remember, our solar energy come from, coming from the sun is 1 for Earth, 1.91 for Venus. The fourth root of 1 for Earth is 1, of course, and the fourth root of 1.91 for Venus is 1.176. So we should expect that the temperature on Venus at one atmosphere at the same pressure, remember, should be 1.176 times 288 Kelvin. Get your calculator out. What's 288? 288 times 1.176 equals 338 Kelvin. Pretty close to the 340 Kelvin, isn't it, really? Now, if you work it backwards, so 340 Kelvin is the temperature of one atmosphere on Venus. Divide by 1.176, you get 289 Kelvin, which is virtually the same within a margin, a tiny margin of error, is 288 Kelvin on Earth. What does that mean? It means that there's no greenhouse effect on Venus. That's what it means. Because how can you have the same temperature, when you take into account insulation, how can you have the same temperature on Venus as on Earth at the same pressure when there's 96.5% greenhouse gases on Venus and only 2.5% of greenhouse gases on Earth. Case closed. Okay, perhaps it's not quite game over yet, uh, but it's hard to imagine atmosphere with such a differing greenhouse gas content as Earth and Venus. Earth with 2.5%, Venus with 96.5%. Yet there still remains very strong similarities in the lapse rate, in the rate of the thermal gradient as seen here, in the relative insulation adjusted temperatures at one atmosphere, these measurements relationships and the similarity of the thermal gradient point strongly towards the existence of a universal physical law which governs planetary atmospheric temperatures and one which does not take into account the relative greenhouse gas content. Instead, this law clearly operates as if greenhouse gas gases are not special. And just like the ideal gas law, really, and the um, molar mass version of the ideal gas law, which is derived from that. But now we know 
the pressure, one atmosphere at 49 kilometers in the Venusian atmosphere. We know the temperature that's been measured, 340 Kelvin. So with this formula, which you probably got, you guys are probably quite familiar with now, we can now calculate the density using this formula here. Uh, density equals pressure times molar mass divided by R, which is a gas constant, times by the temperature. So when we work that out, we get 1.556 kilograms per cubic meter for density. What does this tell us? The density at one atmosphere in Venus, assuming that the atmosphere remains well mixed at a height of 49 kilometers, is 1.556 kilograms per cubic meter. Now remember here we've chosen the pressure, one atmosphere, uh, and almost certainly we know the molar mass because it will remain the same as the surface, just below 44. Therefore, this has isolated any changes in the only free parameter remaining, the density. We're, we're assuming here that insulation and other factors remain the same. The differences to Earth surface parameters are now clear and are caused by the pressure of a heavy, dense atmosphere offset by a density increase mitigated by the higher insulation. The comparison result is a 50% rise in molar mass, which in isolation would translate into a strong warming from 288 Kelvin to 432 Kelvin. But there is also a 27% rise in density over the Earth, Earth's atmosphere at one atmosphere, which relates to considerable offset in cooling. So that results in the final temperature of 340 Kelvin, because 432 drops down when there's a 27% rise in density, it drops down to 340 Kelvin. So revealed here is the advantage of choosing a familiar pressure to work from rather than the unfamiliar Venusian surface pressure. It can be seen that the measured temperature difference from 288 Kelvin on Earth to 340 Kelvin on Venus is directly related to the 50% higher molar mass of the atmosphere combined with the 27% higher insulation moderated atmospheric density and therefore not to its enhanced greenhouse properties which according to this calculation do not really exist even though there's two and a half percent greenhouse gases on earth 96.5 percent greenhouse gases in the venusian atmosphere so looking at the surface parameters on venus it can also be instructive. Again, there is the same 50% increase over Earth in molar mass, which in isolation brings the initial base warming up to 432 Kelvin, as I said before. Then there remains the very, very familiar on Earth battle between pressure and density, which finally determines temperature, given other factors remain the same, such as insulation. Here, pressure clearly wins out with a surface pressure that is 91 times Earth's, and the density settles at 53 times Earth. Remember that um, the Venusian surface atmosphere is 65 kilograms per cubic meter, but Earth is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. So do these numbers point to the end result of a runaway greenhouse effect or to just what would be expected from gas thermodynamics? Taking into account all factors, the evidence suggests the latter. What very likely determines these final numbers is the relationship between the enormous mass of the Venusian atmosphere, the auto-compression pressing down, and the energy put into the upper atmosphere by the sun. And of course you've got convection causing uh, the lapse rate, which is really just a measure of auto-compression and has nothing to do with gr the greenhouse effect. You can only have one cause for a thermal enhancement or a thermal gradient. You can't have two causes. You can't have the greenhouse gas as one cause and the uh, auto compression as another cause. There's only one cause for a lapse rate or, a, or a, an auto compression or a thermal gradient or a thermal enhancement. There's only one cause, not two causes. The one cause on both Earth and Venus is auto compression or the lapse rate, if you want to call it that, which meteorologists do, of course. Okay, so therefore there are many reasons really to conclude that there's no net warming from the Venusian carbon dioxide. Of note is that very little, first, 
very little or no direct solar insulation reaches the Venusian surface in order to create this um, back uh, radiation, the greenhouse effect and back radiation from the greenhouse gases. So less than 20 watts per square meter of uh, direct solar radiation reaches the Venusian surface. Now here's a picture from the surface of Venus. Uh, now, some probes sent to Venus didn't even have a parachute, but the atmosphere was so thick that they didn't need one. They just slowed down and landed okay without a parachute. <laughs> the Venusian atmosphere is so hot that it radiates downwards at the rate of 15,000 watts per square meter down to the surface, even though measurements show that less than 20 watts per square meter of direct solar insulation actually reaches the surface in the first place. So a conventional greenhouse effect of the type described by the IPCC is not possible with these numbers. How can you have uh, less than 20 watts per square meter of solar insulation hitting the surface, creating 15,000 watts per square meters of, of back radiation? doesn't make any sense at all. The answer I propose here is the same as for Earth. Auto compression, adiabatic convection, and the conversion of higher level atmospheric potential energy to lower level kinetic energy. So the near surface conditions of Venus dictate that the entire atmospheric surface layer to a depth of 4 kilometers must be a supercritical fluid. How can you have a greenhouse gas when there's no gas, when it's just a supercritical fluid? And there's no transition point on the way down through this, uh, through this supercritical fluid, as we saw from from the atmospheric measurements of the of the landing craft on Venus, various landing craft. So we can therefore identify five problems with regard to the possibility that the greenhouse gas of CO2 is the cause of Venus's high surface temperatures, as is currently claimed by NASA, the IPCC, most mainstream climate scientists, just about everybody really. What are the five problems or questions we have to address when we're talking about the Venusian atmosphere? I've laid them out here. Now the first one, the first question that might be asked is can a highly compressed and superheated supercritical fluid that is more like an ocean than a gas still possess the greenhouse properties of an ordinary atmospheric gas? As I said before, the bottom four kilometers is... Uh, is a supercritical fluid on Venus. This seems to be highly unlikely. However, it's true that fermions of which CO2 is made, when highly compressed, increase the width of their absorption emission bands because the Pauli exclusion principle prevents fermions from being in the same state and in the same place. Whether this fact has affected the surface supercritical fluid sufficiently to create a gas-like greenhouse effect is unknown at present. The second problem with regard to the greenhouse effect claim for Venus is that the atmosphere is very thick and is optically opaque. More like a thick soup than transparent like the Earth's atmosphere. Measurements from the surface show that much less than 20 watts per square meter of direct shortwave solar insulation actually makes it to the surface of Venus. To warm the surface, for the upwelling infrared radiation to be available to be captured by any possible atmospheric greenhouse gas or greenhouse effect. In fact, the papers I've read on Venus say that direct solar insulation can be neglected below a height of 60 kilometers. So there's virtually nothing that reaches the surface. So virtually all direct solar in, uh, radiation below that level is totally scattered by the thick atmosphere. The flux of this scattered solar insulation was measured on the surface by six separate landers and appears to be very low, average, averaging much, much less than 10% of the 2,644 watts per square meter top of atmosphere insulation flux from the sun. In contrast, Earth receives much more than 12% of its top of atmosphere insulation directly to the surface. 161 watts per square meter of the 1366 watts per square meter, and much more if scattered and atmospheric and back radiation are counted. Now remember that uh, the back radiation from the atmosphere of Venus to the surface, so-called back radiation, is 15,000 watts per square meter. 15,000. Third, 
Venus has a very slow rotation period which makes the Venusian night about 58 Earth days long. During this long night, measurements have been taken of the atmospheric and the surface temperatures and they remain basically the same all through the long night just as they are during the long 58 day Venusian day. Now the surface cools only very very slightly from 737 Kelvin to 732 Kelvin during this very long night. The question might reasonably be reasonably be asked here, how can the greenhouse effect from CO2 be responsible for all this surface heat by trapping upwelling long wave radiation, which doesn't exist, emitted from absorbed direct solar insulation, less than 20 watts per square meter, hence keeping the surface hot with re-emitted downwelling radiation when little or no direct sun arrives at the surface during the day and when no sun at all arrives during the 58 day long night. So how can a greenhouse effect from CO2 operate when there's no sun and operate when there's almost no sun during the day? Fourth, the very high albedo, which is about 70 plus percent, reduces Venus's access to solar insulation. Even though Venus's top of atmosphere insulation is two, almost two times Earth's, the reflectivity of Venus is so high at 75% that this, is more than, this more than cancels out the higher top of atmosphere insulation. This means that although it's closer to the Sun, the Venusian atmosphere as a whole actually absorbs much less solar warmth than Earth does. You can see the calculation there. So the Venusian atmosphere only absorbs 165 watts per square meter. The Earth's atmosphere absorbs 242 watts per square meter. If Venus receives even less net solar radiation than the Earth does, how can it maintain a very much higher temperature profile in the atmosphere because of this lower amount of radiation? Fifth, although this might be expected because of its high density, the Venusian atmosphere moves only slowly at the surface, at less than 10 kilometers an hour, 5 miles an hour. It rotates very rapidly at 70 kilometers in height, the cloud tops level, that is, circling the planet every four days at speeds of up to 360 kilometers per hour or 100 meters per second. Why does the Venusian atmosphere rotate westwards, the opposite way, at 60 times the rotation speed of the planet? And what is the mechanism driving and maintaining it? Given that the atmosphere is open to space and can expand and contract and is in constant motion like this, how is the greenhouse effect of CO2 affected by all this? Could it be subjected to sufficient negative feedbacks to eliminate any net warming from it altogether? And we've seen from the figures that Venusian figures, temperature, pressure and density, are very similar to Earth's, almost the same really, uh, when you allow for insulation differences. Yeah, just a little aside at this point, there's... People have been asking what's behind me. I mean, literally, what's behind me. <laughs> um, I tied it up a little bit behind me for this video. Uh, on the top left, we've got uh, the head of state of Australia, Queen Elizabeth II. And below it, we've got my master's degree um, in environmental engineering. At the bottom middle, we got my degree in astronomy from Swinburne University. At the right, my PhD photo on graduation day. Above right, we've got my mining engineering degree. And top middle is my latest degree, which is a, I was awarded on the 14th of May this year, uh, which is a PhD in climate science slash mitigation. So what makes me uniquely qualified to make these claims? Well, the answer is there. Temperatures that you can get by gases compressing naturally under gravity in the atmosphere. And of course from the climate uh, PhD, I did a lot of work on climate change and mainly covering the science that the IPCC forgot, if you like with more than 500 references to the literature. Okay.